Okay, on behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies at UH Manoa, I would like to welcome everyone to our Spring 2021 CCS seminar series. Please note that this session is being recorded and that the file will be uploaded to the CCS website. The link of which you can now see in the chat forum if you click on the icon at the bottom of your screen. I am the organizer and moderator of the series and my name is Yu Mingbao, Mingbao Yu, from the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature where I teach 20th century Chinese literature, film, and culture. I would also like to take this opportunity here to introduce the hardworking and committed CCS team of staff, led by current CCS director Yang Jihua, David Yang, professor of accounting from Scheidler School of Business, CCS associate director Ren Yomei, Dr. Cindy Ning, and CCS program coordinator Sun Jialing, Ms. Jialing Sun. During the session, if you have any questions or queries about technical or logistical issues, please use the chat forum that will be monitored and answered by Dr. Ning and Ms. Sun. Our complete program flyer for this semester is posted on the CCS website and Instagram, the link which is now posted on the chat forum. Our last event for the semester will take place on April 28th, and it is our fourth and final interregional and interdisciplinary panel with the Center for Southeast Asian Studies that is part of their larger research project focusing on China's relationship with Southeast Asia. We have been very fortunate this year to have secured the participation of Chinese study scholars from around the world, namely Europe, US mainland and Taiwan. Our panel today that focuses on Taiwan US relations in the Biden era is actually our second Taiwan panel this semester and it is co-sponsored by the Center for Regional Cooperation and Competitiveness at the National Taiwan University. A special thanks to the center's director, Tang Daibiao, Professor Daibiao Tang, for his co-sponsorship and for joining us live today from Taipei. Now let me introduce our distinguished panelists today and begin with Professor Tang, who received his PhD in economics from Columbia University, where he was also the recipient of the Columbia University President's Fellow and, Alf uh, Fellow and Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's Dissertation Award. After his return to Taiwan and before he became a professor at National Taiwan University, Professor Tang taught, economics, uh, taught at the Economics Department of University of Missouri, Columbia, as well as at the Social Science Department of Hong Kong Science and uh, Technology University. In addition, he was a guest researcher at the East West Center and a visiting assistant professor with the Economics Department at the University of Hawaii and a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. His research interests include economic development, the history of finance and currency, and he has published widely in major journals such as Journal of Development Economics, Economic Development and Cultural Change, World Economics, and Quarterly Review of Economics and Finance. Also joining us live from Taipei today is Zhou, uh, Zhou, Jia, uh, Zhou Jiachen, sorry, Chelsea Zhou, who is an associate professor at the Graduate Institute uh, of National Development, National Taiwan University. She received her PhD in August 2011 from the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her MA and, PH, uh, her MA and BA um, degrees in 2002 from the Department of Political Science, National Taiwan University, Taipei. Her research interests include comparative politics, authoritarianism, social policies, international relations, and Chinese politics. And she has written numerous articles in these areas, published in major journals, like Journal of Chinese Political Science, Mainland Chinese Studies, Journal of Electoral Studies, Social Policy Administration, and Prospect Quarterly, and other places. Guo Chonglun, also live from Taipei, is a practical associate professor at the Graduate Institute uh, at the Great Institute of Journalism, National Taiwan University. He is currently the deputy editor in chief of United Daily News, which is a major newspaper in Taiwan that is considered to support the Pan Blue Coalition, which is a loose political coalition consisting of KMT, the People's First Party, the New Party, and the Nonpartisan Solidarity, Solidarity Union. Professor Go is currently also acting as the director of the International News Center, the Division of Media and Media Service. And he is the host and moderator of the program, Global Observations. He was also former chief editor of Taiwan's 
Business Weekly and Chief Editor of Taiwan's Times Weekly. Our last panelist, Bill Sharp, who is joining us locally here from Hawaii, is the president of Sharp Translation and Research. He has taught East Asian politics at Hawaii Pacific Uni uh, University for 23 years, including some courses at UH Manoa and Chaminade University. He was the author of the monthly column, Look East, for the Honolulu Star Bulletin, and the host of the program, Asia in Review. His book, Random Views of Asia from the Mid-Pacific, was published 2012. In 2016, he was awarded a Taiwan Fellowship by the Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs that enabled him to conduct research at Taiwan's political polarization, uh, po uh, conduct research, sorry, on Taiwan's political polarization at the Taiwan Sinica Academia. From 2017 to 18, he was a fellow at the Center for Taiwan Studies at Fudan University in Shanghai, and he completed his second Taiwan Fellowship term in 2020. So each of our three panelists will speak for about 15 minutes and represent the perspective of the three countries that have the highest stake, that have the highest stake in the future of the Taiwan and US relationship uh, in the Biden era. So Bill Sharp will be our first speaker and represent the US perspective. Professor Guo will present Taiwan's view and Professor Zhou will represent China's position. And all three, of course, will also share with us their prognosis on the future of the Taiwan-US relationship. After the three panelists finish their presentations, Professor Tang Daibiao and our very own CCS director, David Yang, will offer some comments and questions for, uh, before we go into the Q&A session. At any time during the presentation, we invite everybody to use the Q&A forum to send your comments or questions, which we will monitor and present to our speakers during the Q&A session. So please do not wait to send your question until the very end because we may run out of time to answer them. And in order to accommodate everyone, we kindly ask that you please keep your comments very concise and ask no more than two questions. So we keep within the 30 minutes we have allocated to this part of our program. We will try our best to answer your questions in the order they are received, but we may also synthesize or group together similar questions so that we save time and make room for more comments and queries. So without further ado, let me turn over to our first speaker, Bill Shaw. Bill, unmute yourself, please. Bill, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, here I am. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, I think so. Okay, uh, I've been asked to uh, give an American perspective of the U.S.-Taiwan uh, relationship, and yes, there are many aspects to the relationship, but given the time constraints, I'll focus on four. Uh, oh, okay. One second. Uh, the first one I'll focus on is the Biden administration approach uh, to Taiwan versus the Trump approach. And then I'd like to uh, make a few comments about the defense aspect or security aspects of the relationship. And then I'd like to move on to trade. And then I'd like to talk about semiconductors. And then finally, um, I'll talk, I'll give a conclusion. The Biden administration's approach to Taiwan versus the Trump administration approach. When I was in Taiwan last year, I was often urged by Taiwan friends to vote for Trump in his reelection bid. If Trump was so good, I asked them, for Taiwan, why didn't he open free trade agreement negotiations, to which they had no response? As I see it, Taiwan, um, in Trump's view, was a bargaining chip to use against China to get a better trade deal. And if he got that better trade deal with China, he could have easily dropped Taiwan. On the other hand, Trump's appointees um, very much um, moved the US-Taiwan relationship ahead. And here I'm talking about such people as Matt Pottinger of the National Security Council, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo, National Security Advisor John Bolton, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Dave Stilwell, Assistant Secretary of Defense Randy Schreiber. 
The Biden administration is far less public about Taiwan and does not see Taiwan as a weapon to use against uh, China or a card to be played. Uh, another way of putting that is that uh, President Biden values America's alliances with other countries. He values uh, allies. President Trump had very little time for alliances. They thought they were a waste of money and achieved nothing. And he preferred to recede into somewhat of an isolationist shell versus Biden, who was uh, much more international. The Biden administration's Taiwan policy is rock solid and it's not transactional. Just last week, a high powered US delegation visited Taiwan to reassure the country of Biden's policy. These, uh, the three members of that delegation were all handpicked uh, by President Biden and included former US Senator Christopher Dodd, former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage, and also former Secretary of State, uh, Deputy Secretary of State James Steinbrenner. Let me move on to uh, defense and security aspects of the relationship. Um, I think in recent years, <clears throat> the US has had an increasingly profound appreciation of the geostrategic location of Taiwan. Uh, and its position as a keystone in the first island chain. As such, it plays a crucial role in the defense of the Western Pacific, and especially Guam and Hawaii. If Taiwan were controlled by the People's Republic of China, um, it would be turned into a large naval base, which would further seek to cut off Northeast Asia from Southeast Asia and impede the flow of Middle Eastern oil to South Korea and to Japan. I give President Tsai, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, of course, uh, great credit for uh, emphasizing um, defense issues in Taiwan and uh, trying to build up the Taiwan's defense capability. Um, <clears throat> she has uh, um, pushed uh, several defense um, budget uh, increases. Now the defense budget stands at 2.4% of GDP. Of course, America has all long been uh, trying to influence Taiwan to establish a defense budget of 3% of GDP. I think we're getting there, but it's just gonna take a little more time. The US is keenly concerned about the challenges that Taiwan has in recruiting a sufficient number of personnel to uh, man the, um, uh, the armed forces of Taiwan. In, 19, in 2018, only 81% of the 188,000 uh, slots in the Taiwan military were filled. And of course, a keen, a keen issue, a keen concern of US officials, and it doesn't matter which U.S. official that you talk to, have any U.S. official concerned with Taiwan defense affairs or Taiwan affairs in general, will always uh, talk about the need for Taiwan to really up its game when it comes to the reserves, especially the Army reserves. Theoretically, there are 2.8 million uh, in the Taiwan Reserve Force. However, only about 3,000 of them are combat ready. Um, we have a new uh, Minister of National Defense in Taiwan. He's only been in the position a few months, but all signs are that he's a very aggressive reformer and he is giving a uh, lots of attention to um, the reserve force. And just yesterday, I saw a Taipei Times, in fact, he, he discussed a new structure, uh, administrative structure for the reserve force. And, it looks like what's going to happen is that those in the reserves will have to train more and train longer. <clears throat> Taiwan needs to keep perfecting the overall defense concept, which emphasizes asymmetric warfare, uh, which is a key concern, uh, again, of the United States, but also very much pushed by senior Taiwan military officials. There is indeed the need for joint training, more joint training for Taiwan and the US and more joint training that's visible to the public. There is some joint training now, but it's done in a very sort of low key out of sight way. 
A key, con a key notion, a key concept of U.S. policy towards Taiwan uh, from the days of Chiang Kai-shek was, was a um, policy based on strategic ambiguity. And I think that in recent years, that strategic ambiguity has been reduced somewhat, but not totally. Uh, folks that I converse with in Taiwan um, really uh, would like the U.S. to adopt a policy of strategic clarity and <clears throat> reduce all ambiguity. However, I'll, I'll echo the thoughts of Admiral uh, Dennis Blair, who was the former uh, Commander-in-Chief Pacific, which was the forerunner, forerunner of the Indo-Pacific Command. He, uh, Admiral Blair, is quite familiar with Taiwan, having served as an advisor to several Hongguang, the annual military exercise. And his view was, uh, if you remove uh, strategic ambiguity, that is, go to complete strategic cl uh, clarity, that it could reduce the attention that Taiwan is giving to its defense uh, modernization and <clears throat> the ramping up of its reserve forces. So I think, for at least for now, sticking with a policy of somewhat watered down strategic ambiguity is probably uh, in the best interest of all. Let's talk about trade. Uh, Taiwan has long wanted a free trade agreement with the U.S. and it seems that every time that uh, President Tsai meets with a high level American official, she lobbies for a U.S.-Taiwan FTA. However, it seems that the U.S. economic policy towards Taiwan is based on the Economic Prosperity Partnership Dialogue, which focuses on 5G networks, telecommunications security, investment screening, semiconductors, uh, reestablishing supply lines from China and Taiwan, the development of renewal, renewable energy, et cetera. The American Institute in Taiwan, AIT, and the Taipei Economic Cultural Representative Office, TECRO, announced, <clears throat> excuse me, announced in November of uh, last year their intention to negotiate a science and technology agreement. The U.S. has experienced a trade deficit with Taiwan since 1985. Last year, it amounted to 30 billion U.S. dollars, and this excuse me again, in some people's view is a disincentive for the United States to achieve an FTA with the, uh, Taiwan, arguing that the deficit will only get bigger. And there are other possible ramifications um, of such. Uh, in fact, it would greatly incense China. However, on the other hand, it could reduce Taiwan's economic dependence on China, which is clearly in the U.S. strategic interest. But there is a big stumbling block to the U.S.-Taiwan uh, FTA, and that is the importation to Taiwan of U.S. pork treated with ractopamine, which is a, uh, a keen interest of U.S. pork farmers who are supported by U.S. Senator Grassley of Iowa. Iowa is a key pork breeding state whose six electoral votes were hotly contested for during the recent U.S. election. President Tsai greenlighted the importation of uh, U.S. pork treated with ractopamine uh, in August of last year. However, it set off a huge furor amongst Taiwan citizens who are concerned about the healthiness of U.S. pork treated with ractopamine. Large demonstrations ensued and spilled over into the legislature, the Li Fa Yuan, and pitted legislators against one another, resulting in pig parts being scattered in the legislative chamber. On August 28th of this year, there will be a referendum determining whether importation of U.S. pork treated with ractopamine will go forward or not. Semiconductors. Um, Saudi Arabia has oil, China has rare earths, Taiwan has semiconductors. 
leading many commentators to say Taiwan is the most important country in the world. Semiconductors are, in fact, the engine of future economic growth. Taiwan, led by the Taiwan Semiconductors Manufacturing Corporation, makes the best semiconductors in the world. China can't produce the quality or sorts of semiconductors that Taiwan can. Just before today's program, I was watching Nendai or ERA TV news report, and they were interviewing um, Mr. Zhang, uh, the founder of uh, Taiwan Semiconductors, and he um, uh, argued that China is five years behind Taiwan in the production of uh, high quality, cutting edge semiconductors. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor sells to both China and the U.S. And the U.S. wants the company to limit its sales to China. And in fact, the company has stopped selling to Huawei, one of its largest customers at U.S. insistence. Moreover, it will build a foundry in Arizona. Conclusion. Uh, if the U.S. really sees Taiwan as an indispensable Indo-Pacific partner and given its importance in the production of semiconductors, it should sign an FTA with Taiwan. Japan always runs a trade surplus with the U.S. However, it is considered a crucial security partner. And there is the intention expressed between uh, both governments, the government of Japan and the government of the United States, to sign a free trade agreement. Mm. According to December 1, 2019 figures, the U.S. spent 5.7 billion U.S. dollars posting troops in Japan in 2019. In 2020, Japan enjoyed a 55 billion dollar uh, U.S. dollar trade surplus with the U.S. Korea has an FTA with the U.S., and the U.S., again, according to December 1, 2019 figures, spent $4.5 uh, billion U.S. dollars to post troops there. In 2020, Korea enjoyed a near $25 billion trade surplus with the U.S. The U.S. has no troops stationed in Taiwan. The U.S. should sign an FTA with Taiwan to further solidify its relationship with Taiwan. And let me conclude with uh, something nice. Thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very uh, much. And now we have a question at the end. Now we have Professor Guo representing Taiwan's perspective. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, um, there's in my presentation, uh, there's uh, something overlapping with Bill presentation. And also, I think you will find that uh, there's some overlapping uh, with Professor Cho's as well, uh, because uh, I'm seeing uh, Biden administration's uh, policy from a Taiwan perspective, because as a junior partner, in the triangular relationship, we have to pay attention what kind of policy the U.S. is having and what kind of reaction China may have uh, towards this. So uh, I will show you uh, my uh, presentation uh, uh, and my PowerPoint uh, at this time. Uh, first of all, um, is the questions. Um, as you know, that um, there's a lot of uh, thinking about uh, whether Biden would change uh, Trump uh, policy when he get in office, uh, especially when Biden is, uh, uh, is having such a close relations with Xi Jinping. And also, uh, he said that he's going to uh, overturn a lot of policy done by uh, done by Biden. So, um, and because of that, um, uh, and also I, I like to see that um, Taiwan policy uh, used to be part of the China policy. Uh, before 2016, uh, there's only one China policy and always 
the U.S. Taiwan policy was subject uh, to the China policy. Um, and sometimes even Washington would jointly manage the Taiwan issue with Beijing, especially during uh, the, the 2004, 2008, uh, the second term of the President Chen. But, yes, yes. PowerPoint, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Can you share your PowerPoint? Are you uh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about it. <laughs> okay, yeah. got it. Got it. Uh, okay. Um, the thing is, uh, I want to show you is that um, my my question about uh, the whole uh, Biden administration is whether the Biden is going to change what's been going on uh, in the Trump administration. Uh, because since 2016, that, um, that um, Trump seemed to be uh, having an independent uh, Taiwan policy, especially since uh, it's core uh, with President Tsai. And uh, now Taiwan policy, just like Bill had mentioned, had begun to become a leverage against China. And what would the Biden uh, administration Taiwan policy is going to be? That is the reason uh, uh, a lot of people both uh, in Taiwan and in China are wondering. Um, the reason why uh, Biden should be uh, different uh, is, uh, first of all, um, Biden, when he's in his campaign, he's running on the anti-Trump uh, platform and tend to deny anything Trump had done. Uh, this uh, should also include uh, American, China, and Taiwan policy as well. People thought that. And, and Biden is also an old-fashioned politician who had been operating uh, on the personal bounding. Uh, when he was the vice president, Biden spent a lot of time uh, with the then uh, vice president, uh, Xi. Um, according to New York Times, uh, they have... Uh, have conferences uh, at least uh, eight times. They have spent about 24 hours uh, alone, uh, only with uh, joined with the interpreter, uh, dining or having uh, uh, shooting uh, baskets, so, some, so on and so forth. So uh, he had very close relations uh, with President Xi. But the strange thing is um, he had uh, he had not made the call to President Xi uh, after he get elected, and only until he get in office, uh, after he had made all the calls uh, with other foreign leaders, then he had made the call to uh, President Xi. This was seen as a pretty much a good indicator what would be the future relation between China and, um, and the United States. Um, but uh, before that, uh, the rumor has it, uh, Biden is even having a closer relations with China, uh, especially regarding the information uh, when she first get in office, because she had a, a, a strong competitor at the time, Bo Xilai. Uh, it was said that Biden had provided uh, with Xi some of the vital information regarding uh, how Bo Xilai had been wiretapping the high-level officials uh, from uh, the Chinese uh, leaders. And this had contributed to the eventual downfall of Bo Xilai. And, um, and this information was being given by uh, Wang Li, uh, uh, by, by Bo's uh, deputy, uh, Mr. Wang, who had been defected uh, to uh, seeking political asylum from the American Council General in Chengdu. Um, at the time when Biden got in office, Taiwan was also uh, kind of nervous because they are wondering whether Biden will have a U-turn on Taiwan policy. Um, in, during the campaign, uh, there's a general move in Taiwan that uh, they are supporting more uh, uh, of Donald Trump as a candidate. Uh, because Trump had a very favorable pro-Taiwan policy in his administration. And there's uh, even some media in Taiwan uh, was uh, reporting on some of the fake news about Hunter Biden's connection with Beijing. And um, 
at the time, um, there seemed to be some um, negative perception coming from the Biden administration, a Biden team, uh, and it's not even an administration yet, about Taiwan. Uh, they are wondering and, and worry that we, maybe Taipei is uh, putting all its money on the Trump campaign. So, um, and, and some of the DP politicians, uh, they are supporting uh, opening about uh, Donald Trump. And also Beijing are hoping as well with the wrong impression, uh, they are expecting uh, the future President Biden would do the right thing and hope to have a restart on the bilateral relations by repeating uh, what, uh, because Biden had been the vice president of Obama, uh, President Obama, they are hoping they can revive what uh, President uh, Obama had been doing. It's called strategic and economic dialogue. Um, the, this strategic and economic dialogue is something that had been happening uh, throughout most of the uh, uh, Obama administration, meaning that they met once a year. Uh, and they discuss over with all the issues that have been going on uh, between two countries. And maybe uh, the two leaders may have a, a once in a while, uh, probably uh, no less than two years, uh, uh, like a summit uh, conference and, and move uh, and, and sort it out all of the difficult issues uh, between the two countries. And um, Beijing in January uh, this, this year seemed to be floating that uh, idea about how they are expecting uh, this kind of dialogue should begin. But um, this kind of hope and expectation seemed to fade away uh, pretty soon um, after um, Biden administration formally invited uh, the Taiwan's de facto ambassador Xiao Meiqing to participate in the inauguration ceremony of uh, President Biden and Vice President uh, Harris. And um, because of that, China had responded uh, flying uh, 13 warplanes uh, over into Taiwan ADI zone, uh, air defense identification zone. And the following day, there's uh, more, there's 15 planes. Uh, this had become um, a model, uh, uh, a future pattern uh, for, for China to react, something that uh, they don't like to see uh, happening between Taipei and Washington. Um, and this is uh, the ADI zone uh, map, as you're seeing. Uh, the, the, the left lower corner uh, is the place that uh, uh, there's a lot of constantly warplanes uh, going back and forth. But you have to notice that between Taiwan and China, there's a middle line. Uh, that is, it's not an artificial border, but it's something that is, uh, is a tacit understanding that you don't go over it. Uh, and what uh, China have been doing uh, from time to time, uh, they have increased its frequency crossing the border. Uh, crossing this midline. This midline uh, is somewhat considered very dangerous for Ch for Taiwan because uh, once you cross the red line, uh, cross the middle line, that would leave Taiwan with only like uh, six minutes of reaction uh, before the plane will actually flew over Taipei. And I think um, this uh, is somewhat, uh, like I said, um, China had done that uh, in the previous uh, Trump administration when uh, there is a, a Secretary of Health uh, visiting Taiwan and when there's Under Secretary of State uh, Keith Crouch uh, visiting Taiwan. And you are seeing that uh, they are repeating uh, this pattern. And this is the warplanes. Uh, the top is the bomber. The lower will be, uh, will be the, the fighters uh, that has been uh, photographed by the, uh, by the Taiwan uh, Air Force. And Washington, especially the Biden administration, have been reacting very strongly uh, about uh, the incursion of uh, Chinese uh, warplanes. Uh, they have uh, said it in the State Department uh, spokesman that said the behavior threatened regional peace 
and stability, and Washington's commitment to Taiwan was rock solid. Uh, do remember this word because it will come up repeatedly. Uh, and this is the important pattern, uh, words uh, passing, that we urge Beijing to create its military, uh, diplomatic, and economic pressure against Taiwan, and instead of engage in a meaningful dialogue with Taiwan's democratically elected uh, representatives. Um, you can see that um, on the one hand, uh, the United States have been uh, making it very clear they're going to react to this kind of hostile activity. But on the other hand, they are also urging they should have a dialogue between Taiwan and China. And this dialogue is without precondition, not under the precondition of China had been insisting on the 92 uh, consensus. And, um, and in order to uh, make his point, Washington has sent in the guided missile destroyers uh, to uh, the Taiwan Straits. Uh, it had uh, been repeating its uh, military uh, incursion uh, over times. Um, and Regarding China, uh, the U.S. have been uh, keep referring uh, China as a strategic competitors. Uh, this had been mentioned in President Biden's uh, first uh, foreign uh, policy address, and it's been also uh, been mentioned in the interim national security strategic uh, guidelines. I think it's best been summarized uh, by Secretary Blinken's uh, speech. He said that our relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversary when it must be. Uh, the common demonstrator is the need to engage China from a position of strong. And I think that had been the U.S. policy uh, ever since. Um, it had, he has said the similar kind of words in his meeting with uh, the Chinese counterpart in Alaska as well. Um, but uh, I should uh, warn everyone that um, this there's also a darker side of U.S. Uh, policy regarding Taiwan. I think Admiral um, uh, Davidson had been uh, saying this. Uh, this is something that is alarming Taiwan very much. He's literally saying that uh, China could evade Taiwan in the next six years. And uh, Taiwan is clearly uh, one of uh, the Chinese ambitions. And um, I think the threat is manifest uh, during this, this decade, in fact, in the next six years. Um, this had never been uh, spoken by American officials, especially uh, the men like uh, Emma Davidson, who has been in charge of all the military balance uh, affairs uh, in the Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific areas. So I think it's uh, quite an alarming uh, thing um, for, for us to remember. But regarding the U.S. policy uh, on Taiwan, uh, I think um, uh, Xiao Meiqing had a pretty good uh, response and summer up uh, in her speech, uh, in her interview with the diplomat uh, in the February, she said uh, there are several things that uh, Taiwan is looking at the U.S. policy. One is uh, on general defense and security. The second would be on economics relationship, and the third would be on international participations. And he, she's uh, keep uh, saying that he, he, she also noticed that um, there's a repeated use of phrase rock solid from the Biden administration, uh, which seems to be a new keyword used frequently by members of the new team. Um, on defense and security, she's saying that it's very important uh, that uh, ever since the Trump administration, there's a new practice of needs-based review system. Uh, she's hoping that the Biden administration would continue because in the old days uh, when Taiwan is making a military uh, equipment request uh, from uh, to the United States, usually it would be uh, lump up together uh, and wait till uh, a certain moments and then they'll approve the whole package. 
But the bad thing about this kind of practice is that、uh, it will always subject to political consideration, especially its relations, American relations uh, with uh, China. So now it's a needs-based、uh, review, meaning that whenever there's a request,、um, the U.S. will consider that on its own merits. So、uh, it will be very quick and will be、uh, according to Taiwan's own defense needs. And on economic cooperation, this、uh, I think uh, shop uh, Professor Shop also mentioned about this um, that um,、uh, Xiao Meiqing had uh, mentioned that um, um, that President Tsai had、uh, making a great political sacrifice by re removing uh, uh, the barriers、uh, of U.S. and Taiwan trade by. Uh, lifting all the restrictions on importing U.S. beef and pork, and、um, this had run into a big、uh, political opposition.、Uh, and now the opposition party is going to have a referendum uh, regarding uh, and try to reverse this decision.、Um, and、uh, Xiao Meiqing is trying to emphasize that.、Um, Uh, this uh, is not done with a big political sacrifice. Of course,、uh, Taiwan is aware that President Biden is not going to sign any、uh, new agreement uh, uh, in the initial phase of his administration. But Taiwan is hoping to to restart the TIFA talks between the U.S. and Taiwan, and hope that can give、uh, a lot of political clout、uh, for President Tsai. Uh, when he's、uh, going to run into all the difficulty、uh, and opposition from lifting all this、uh, U.S. beef and pork imports,、um, and after、uh, Xiao Meiqing's interview, we are seeing more progress on U.S.-Taiwan uh, uh, relations, especially、uh, the new guidelines. I think the new guideline for U.S.-Taiwan exchange would be very significant because it had lifted. All the restrictions、uh, between the meeting officials、uh, from both sides and now allow working level meeting to be held in places、uh, inside the federal buildings of the United States and also Taiwan representative office、uh, in Washington. And、uh, I think、uh, that that is first been done by Donald Trump、uh, when he's、uh, just eleven days before he leave his office. But now I think、uh, it's more meaningful when uh, uh, President Biden is going to、uh, continue that as a policy. You see, this is the Twin Oaks,、uh, that is the official residence of Taiwan representative. Now、uh, the officials can, U.S. officials can can enter in the buildings, but not on、uh, certain significant uh, political sensitive.、Uh, Dates like October 10th, the Taiwan National Day. This is the way that、uh, Biden administration still keep its one China policy,、uh, at least on the surface. Um, uh, and uh, this, uh, the new, there's a、uh, the delegation going to、uh, Taiwan by, led by uh, Senator uh, Dob. Uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, Bill had mentioned it already. But、uh, I think、uh, while in the meantime, China still wait for the reset. Uh, uh, we mentioned about the phone call between the two leaders, and、uh, Wang Yi also、uh, is hoping that they can restart cooperation、uh, and have a meeting、uh, between them.、Um, but、uh, I think Biden administration、uh, had always、uh, seen this suspiciously as a trap, as a trap、uh, that it will pull the U.S. back. Uh, from uh, the competing、uh, with China, they are worried that any agreement with China would、uh, have collapsed beneath the weight of Beijing's actual behavior, and as well as、uh, opposition in Washington. I think this is also very important because、uh, now there is a consensus among Democrat and Republican in Washington that they should be strong and tough on China, and this is actually the motivation. For、uh, a lot of a、uh, uh, lot of、uh, secretary being approved, and also a lot of、uh, act being approved、uh, because of this consensus. Now,、uh, I think Biden administration 
is also going to uh, build on this consensus uh, and is not easy to going to change. Um, I think the uh, Anchorage uh, uh, meeting between China and the United States uh, will be something uh, that uh, Professor Cho is going to discuss about. Uh, uh, I would uh, end my uh, presentation here and um, hope uh, expecting some more questions. Professor Cho. Thank you very much, Professor Guo. So our last speaker is Professor Zhou. Are you there? Yeah, you I'm, here. I'm, I'm here, but uh, yeah, okay. Um, Before you start, yeah. right, I'd just like to invite and remind the audience to send their questions through the Q&A forum you can see at the bottom of your screen, okay? Okay, um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Chelsea Zhou from National Taiwan University. I'm going to present uh, Taiwanese interpretation of the China position toward Taiwan uh, during the Biden era. Uh, I'm gonna play my PowerPoint. Okay, um, so uh, so in this 15 presentation, I'm gonna talk about uh, China's current positions and cu current policies. And I'm gonna uh, also elaborate some of the uh, possible choices and the potential scenarios across those rates. And uh, I hope this presentation will be a good uh, supplementary to what we have already heard from uh, Bill and Professor Guo, because they have already laid out very nice uh, uh, perspectives regarding uh, uh, U.S. And, and Taiwan as well. So in, in, in China, definitely the cross-trade relations is under Xi Jinping's doctrine of the five articles. Uh, these five articles were introduced in 2019, uh, which was already two years ago, but it was still a, a a, a high uh, doctrine uh, undergoing here right now, and it's the basics of any uh, cross-trade policies uh, provided by China. And uh, in these uh, articles, there were actually nothing new, except only one close, uh, only the second article, uh, which lay out that uh, the Chinese government is gonna propose a Taiwan plan of a one, China, one country, two systems. Because we all know that the one country, two systems were introduced uh, in the uh, Deng Xiaoping era to solve the Hong Kong problem. Um, and uh, right now, uh, it, it, there is something going on in Hong Kong and uh, uh, the Chinese government is facing quite a lot of difficulties in, in Hong Kong, in governing Hong Kong. So they are thinking that it should be like a Taiwanese version of a one country, two systems, which it is, uh, which should be different from uh, the one imposing on, on Hong Kong right now. Uh, but uh, we, at this moment, we don't really know the uh, concrete content of this Taiwan version, Taiwanese version, uh, except uh, that we have already seen quite a lot of uh, military intentions in this region. Um, yeah, political, uh, I think in these uh, five articles, there are uh, three aspects that we can talk about. The first one is regarding the political relationships, and the second one is about uh, economic relationship, and the second and the last one is about defense and security uh, relationships. And regarding the political relationship, uh, definitely the PRC, uh, the, the mainland China, the mainland Chinese government does not recognize the jurisdiction of the Taiwanese government, nor. Uh, does the PRC recognize the na national title of the uh, ROC? So I would say that the reason why there is uh, so much difficulty regarding Taiwan's international presence, as well as uh, the, the, the difficulties that Taiwan is facing right now when Taiwan is wanting to have some trade negotiations and trade tr treaties uh, uh, negotiations with the U.S. The, the, the Chinese government will always say that because the, Taiwan is really not a, a country uh, from their perspective, so uh, it's a problem if uh, we have the international uh, sovereignty uh, presence in, 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 in the region. Um, so including in the uh, Trump administration and also in a new Biden administration, China, uh, in addition to using lots of military presence in the cross-trade relations, uh, the, the, there is a constantly a language attack 
from uh, the regular press conference of the Taiwanese Affairs Office of the State Council of China. So uh, although I think President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan uh, has, has uh, uh, constantly emphasizing that she is respecting the national title of uh, Republic of China, which is different from Republic of Taiwan. But uh, from the CCP's perspective, the DPP, the current ruling party, is still a political party seeking independence. So although China hasn't directly criticized Tsai Ing-wen, but the, during the Taiwan Affairs Office conference, there are quite a lot of uh, criticism uh, from uh, the Chinese side. Uh, for example, China is criticizing that Taiwan is seeking for uh, some kind of independence during the pandemic uh, using the slogan of Taiwan can help all over the Twitter uh, and, and lots of social media platform. Um, so it's kind of a gesture of Taiwanese government's um, intention to seek for independence. And there are obviously other kinds of criticism, including uh, criticism about Taiwan relying on the U.S. for independence. Uh, and as I mentioned, that uh, China has already uh, announced a new law called National Security Law to govern the Hong Kong issue. Uh, but regarding Taiwan, uh, actually 15 years ago, there were already uh, anti-secession uh, law promulgated in 2005. And uh, I think last year, uh, during the Trump administration, uh, China is thinking to announce a new law called National Unification Law uh, to regularize, uh, regu regulate uh, Taiwan relations. Um, but this hasn't happened. Uh, but this year, we can see that there are quite a lot of high-profile symposium happening uh, right now to celebrate the uh, 15th anniversary of the anti-secession law. Uh, so I guess this law will still serve as the foundation of cross relations relations, uh, uh, along with the CS5 article. Okay, so regarding the security relations, uh, right now definitely there has been quite a lot of military uh, presence in Taiwan, uh, across the Taiwan Strait uh, right now. So the military aircrafts and ships has been sailing around Taiwan, and those has been uh, hit new heights. Uh, but that being said, the economic relationship between the two sides are still quite quite uh, uh, prevalent right now. It's quite, quite uh, it's developing right now. Um, so, like for example, this year uh, during the two assemblies of the China's National uh, Congress, the National People's Congress, uh, the new 15 five-year uh, plan has been already been announced. Uh, and in this five-year plan, we can see there are some clauses regarding the crossroad relations. And in these clauses, we can see that China still has the intention to promote some kind of peaceful development and integration of the crossroad relations. So the Chinese government continue uh, to implement policies and measures to, in order to benefit Taiwan and its people. So the CCP will still take the lead to that Taiwanese people to benefit from the development of uh, and the economic opportunities of China. So it looks like China is still putting Taiwan's issue into the CCP's national development strategy, the grand strategy of, of China's development. Uh, that's China's policy, but if we look at uh, the trade relationship right now, uh, even during the pandemic, the trade relationship has actually not been effectively uh, has not been affected significantly. So we still see that there are quite a lot of trade between the two sides. For example, uh, last year in two, 2020, Taiwan's total exports to China still increased by 16% compared to uh, last, uh, from, compared to two years ago in 2019. And also uh, Taiwan's imports from China, uh, China is still growing right now. Uh, but uh, uh, I think China is still using sticks as well as carrots right now. So like, for example, this year, uh, we see that China suspended the import of pineapple from Taiwan. 
and that, that uh, aroused a huge uh, uh, criticism from the Taiwanese side. So let's talk about the military action. Uh, so uh, we know that there are quite a lot of aircraft and uh, ships going on uh, in the cross street and even entering our ADIZ, uh, as mentioned by <coughs> Professor Guo. Uh, and uh, I, I think there is definitely an intention from the China side that is China always fears that it will be encircled by the US forces uh, under <coughs> the first island chain defense line. So. Uh, I think this kind of uh, military presence from the Chinese side will always happening here, uh, given that China is becoming bigger uh, economically and militarily. So it wants to go out the first uh, island chain defense line. So China will definitely continue to actively strengthen military preparations. Um, but would China really take any initiative or a sudden move to use military force against Taiwan, uh, like we uh, something that we can see in uh, uh, 2014 in Crimea's case. But I would say that uh, right now the US uh, strategic ambiguity as laid out by Bill uh, has actually ha has quite a lot of impact here uh, in cross world relations regarding the military relationships. Uh, so the US is playing some kind of defense uh, and deterrence strategy here. Uh, so although it's ambiguous, but China still cannot know that whether the US will definitely come to Taiwan if it initiates a uh, military war against Taiwan. So strategic ambiguity uh, still has some impacts and some effects in deterring China's taking the first initiative. Uh, but the US uh, uh, right now is like, as Bill mentioned, is so in a uh, soft, softened the uh, rhetoric of strategic ambiguity is probably moving toward strategic clarity. But I think in the Biden administration, as he is a very, uh, 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 as an expert in the uh, di diplomacy for a long time, I think strategic clarity will not really happen in the short term because there are still quite a lot of people in the DC area who are thinking that strategic clarity would actually encourage Taiwan to take some aggressive actions. So I think strategic ambiguity is uh, reframing, uh, it is aiming to reframe China from taking military actions, but it's also uh, leads to the fact that Taiwan is being reframing from taking aggressive or uh, initiative actions to change the status quo. Uh, okay, so from the Chinese perspectives, uh, I think there is so, uh, uh, there's also quite a lot of counts of taking military actions toward Taiwan because it will harm its credibility of uh, peaceful rights. China has been laid out this kind of rhetoric for a long time since the Hu Jinping era. So it was already uh, introduced like two, 20 years ago. So China would like to keep its promise on its uh, peaceful rise uh, strategy. Um, and there is also something, uh, uh, some kind of uh, debate going on, that is whether China will take some initiative uh, to attack the islands of Taiwan, including Jinmen and Mazu. As you can see in this map, Jinmen and Mazu is very close to Taiwan, and it's actually on the other side of the, of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, so the, the rumor uh, has this rationale that the Chinese government probably will take this kind of initiative in order to test the US's credibility, that is to test the strategic ambiguity strategy laid out by the US. Um, I would say that it's, it's, I, I don't really think it's, pass, it's, it's a good choice for China because if China really take this kind of uh, initiative, military initiative to uh, attack Jima and Mazu, it will definitely, uh, again, demonstrate it's not a peacefully rising, it's really a revisionist power. And it also is a big shock for Taiwanese people. Uh, that is, uh, it, the China uh, will someday uh, definitely invade Taiwan. Uh, and, they, uh, and that also harmed China's uh, long-term strategy to have some kind of economic and cultural integration with Taiwan. Um, so 
Uh, and also the other disadvantage of this action is that it will uh, lead Taiwan to make more military preparations against uh, China's future attack on the island itself. Okay, uh, but I think it, during the Biden era, uh, the tensions will still probably continue because there are quite a lot of domestic concerns within China right now. As we will see that next year, 2022, China will welcome its uh, uh, 20th CCP National Congress and Xi Jinping will definitely seek for the third term. Uh, and uh, some people would say that having a uh, victory, military victory over Taiwan would secure him a third term. But I would say that uh, Xi Jinping has already secured his term uh, based on other kinds of uh, policies, including poverty alleviation campaign, and including corruption alleviation campaign. So he, he probably doesn't really need the Taiwan uh, victory to gain the third term. So I wouldn't really see that the 2022 by the uh, uh, 20th CCP National Congress, there would be a military reaction towards Taiwan. But uh, this kind of domestic audience and using the nationalist card and nationalist sentiments is always there. So the tensions across the street will definitely continue. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is that I think in Chinese government's official mind, there are three kinds of goals that the, it really wants to achieve regarding the cross world relations. So definitely the ultimate goal is reunification. But reunification is not that easy to achieve, and it looks like it becomes a long-term goal. Uh, and China has been focusing on anti-independence, uh, but anti-independence that does not necessarily mean that there will be a reunification. Uh, so right now, I think China is entering into a second stage, that is to promote some kind of integration, uh, particularly about economic exchanges and cultural exchanges, and even some kind of brand drain strategy to attract Taiwanese talents to move to China. And um, so that will, they will have some uh, stakes in China uh, rather than in Taiwan. Uh, so I guess right now the, the, the emphasis is really on integration. Uh, and uh, at the same time, China will still uh, hold the anti-independence, but anti-independence will be through in, uh, establishing the military intimidation. And, and the, the piece of evidence to support that China is promoting integration is that uh, recently, uh, within the, these two years, China has already announced quite a lot of notices about uh, 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 bringing Taiwanese enterprises into its uh, national development strategy, including the one that was passed last year in 2020 May. And, and that notice was about uh, to uh, respond to the pandemic. Uh, the, Taiwan, the Chinese government should help Taiwanese enterprises to develop. And also this year, actually only like, uh, uh, last week, uh, last month, the Taiwan Affairs Office also make a new announcement regarding the two measures of agriculture and uh, forestry. And uh, it also says quite a lot of things about uh, bringing Taiwanese farmers associations and fish associations to come to China to join the rural development of, uh, of, uh, of China. And it's it, so it looks like Taiwan's farmers and fishermen are being included into China's strategy of uh, revitalizing its rural development. So, so I guess I, one thing I want to uh, discuss is that whether China is adopting a more long-term strategy or long-term approach, I would say yes, uh, because the PRC seems to realize that unification cannot be really achieved in the near future. So the, the, the long-term is definitely unification, but the short-term strategy is to have uh, Taiwan uh, to stay in uh, the one China principle framework to prevent China, uh, to prevent Taiwan from declaring de jure independence. Uh, but at the same time, it's using any kinds of strategy to 
uh, integrate Taiwan as people, uh, especially as businessmen. Uh, but rather rhetorically speaking, China is still saying that the current principle is peaceful reunification. But I think one thing that is open to debate is that does China really think that a peaceful reunification can be achieved? Or uh, in the future, there are still some kinds of military uh, resolution that is going to happen. So I think if China is thinking this way, then the US's deterrence uh, is very important right now uh, in the cross trade. Okay. Um, I think uh, several years ago, China's original long-term strategy was to make Taiwan dependent on, on the mainland, uh, including creating some kind of domestic constituency supporting China or the more pro-China political party winning the election. But recently, that didn't happen in Taiwan. Uh, so China actually also realized it's hard to form uh, political ties only through the economic ties. So I guess in the short term, China will still using the strategy of uh, uh, promoting integration. But uh, I think it's open to debate that whether in the long term, China is really thinking about uh, some kind of uh, um, possibility of using a military force. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I'm gonna stop here, here. I think some of the viewpoints I make might be somehow provocative. I really look forward to your comments and discussions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Zhou. And I would like to invite um, Professor Guo and Bill Sharp to come back on screen. And as well, Professor Tang and, Pro and Professor David Yang. Uh, we do have three questions from the audience, one specifically for Professor Guo and one, two questions that are very broad for everybody, right? But I would like to first uh, give Professor Tang and Professor David Yang an opportunity to briefly share their, you know, comments on this presentation. Thank you very much to our three panelists for a very, very rich and informative presentation. So, Professor Tang, would you like to just give... Okay, okay thank you. Uh, the mention of Taiwan uh, in a joint statement by the U.S. President and the Japanese Prime Minister has left uh, much to interpretation because uh, this is the first time since uh, 1969 that Taiwan was mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, post-summit uh, document. Uh, so I believe now is a four-player game including China, uh, U the US, Taiwan, and Japan as well. So my question to our uh, speakers, uh, while China and the US uh, uh, go to war over Taiwan, and what can Japan do uh, when actual contingencies occur uh, in the Taiwan Strait? So that's my question. That's actually a great question because we, we were sent a question by the audience anonymously before we start a webinar, which is along, I think, the same line as Professor Tang just asked the question, which is, is Taiwan becoming a pawn in the US and China power race? So let's just tack it on to Professor Tang's question. So maybe Professor Guo or Professor Zhou, you would like to respond. Bill, are you there? Can you come back? <laughs> Uh, maybe um, I will uh, try to uh, answer the question and maybe I will lead a uh, more uh, fruitful and interesting uh, answer uh, in the following up. But um, in order to answer, uh, is, China, is Taiwan going to be a pawn uh, for the United States uh, to against uh, China? I think that is exactly what uh, the Biden administration tried to avoid. If they consider uh, the Trump administration have been using Taiwan as a leverage, just like Bill had mentioned, in order to get the maximum uh, trade benefit out of China. Um, but uh, what kind of China would uh, react to this would depends on two kinds of totally different assumptions. Just like Professor Cho had mentioned, 
uh, what China is determined to have a unification timetable um, out of uh, Xi Jinping's own uh, want to leave its uh, historical legacy, or is it China being put in the corner uh, by their perception of both China, by the United States or by Taiwan? A Taiwan want to be independent, and the U.S. is uh, overstepping its one China policy uh, red line. And that is the China uh, worrying. And any leader uh, cannot uh, stay in his position if uh, he or she is not reacting to this uh, splitting up uh, the motherland's attempt. So this is a very different assumption that will lead to very different con to conclusion. Um, and I would say that the strategy of ambiguity still work here is exactly because uh, that you don't want to show your strong preference in defending Taiwan, just like the strategy of clarity had been. If you show that tendency, that will lead China to believe that the U.S. is going to give a blank, blank, check to, blank check to Taiwan and will support Taiwan no matter what. I think uh, all things are linked together in that regard. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. And could you please uh, limit your comments to one minute because there are two questions that I think that okay. would be... Okay, I, I don't think that uh, China will attack Taiwan for several reasons. I think that it will, its strategy is to play a psychological game to wear Taiwan down, to make it exasperated, uh, to maybe run up the military maintenance budget, uh, etc. If Taiwan is attacked by China, there will be collateral damage, and this will lead to uh, a very bad feeling amongst the Chinese public, uh, the Taiwan public. And essentially, the mainland will have created another 228 situation, which will make Taiwan very hard to control. Um, um, you sometimes hear that um, China, well, it'll attack Jinmen, it'll attack Mazu. I don't think that's going to happen for several reasons. Uh, one is, um, it, it seems that there's some people in Taiwan, I won't say affiliated with which party, but they almost would wish that Jinmen or Mazu would be part of China because that would break a kind of perceptual bridge uh, from China to Taiwan that, you know, it's all one China. Um, I think there's some possibility that, um, that China might attack Dongsha because Dongsha or practice islands is in a very strategic area. Uh, as that, depending how you look at it, at the exit or entrance of the Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Haixia, the Taiwan Strait, and also at the entrance of the exit, again, depending how you look at it, the Bashu Channel. Some people have commented that uh, control of Dongsha by the PRC would also give it a great staging area to um, start about a, a boycott of Taiwan. Um, so I don't think, and especially in, um, in, in the next few years, I don't think that China will attack Taiwan because in, um, if it were to attack Taiwan, um, you know, the um, several countries would pull out of the 2022 Olympics in uh, China. It also would create a bad environment in which uh, Xi Jinping will go into the 20th Party Congress. And of course, he wants that third term, no matter what. Uh, there's some other reasons I might cite, but I know time is uh, of the essence, so I'll stop here. Right. I, I totally agree with uh, the two uh, professors, uh, but I, I just want to add one thing that is about Japan. I think Japan is never taking a containment strategy toward China, and Japan definitely does not really want to engage any military actions with, with China. And uh, Japan is always like balancing and hedging with China, it's still cultivating quite a lot of relationship with China. So I don't really think Japan really wants to like uh, taking uh, this strong military action against uh, China. Can I comment to Chelsea's comment? <laughs> Can I piggyback on that, Mingbao? Well, it's very quick. <laughs> Yeah, but okay. I, 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 I always remember the expression, the security of uh, Taiwan is the security of Japan. And 
I think the Japanese military might like to get involved in any contingency over Taiwan, but it's the civilian population that's really reluctant to do so because of their great dependence on the Chinese market and the role and the power of the Kadon men, the so-called Japanese Chamber of Commerce. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kevin, do you want to say something or do you want to respond to the question we have? We have a question and I think it's actually for Professor Guo, but I would like all of you to respond to it. And this is about China's incursion of the ADIZ. It says it happens several times per year. It seems like without a Taiwan response, there are no consequences to their regular incursions. With the U.S. downsizing bases in Okinawa and Philippines, it seems reasonable that the U.S. would want to establish a military presence in Taiwan. This is the question by, uh, from David Zhang. I also think the Taiwan population would welcome a U.S. base. So what are the major factors that prevent the U.S. from establishing a military presence in Taiwan? Also, if military presence is not an option, what about Taiwan allowing some kind of special zoning in Taiwan favoring U.S. relations, similar to Hong Kong, Jingming, or Hainan? As an example, China could enter the ADIZ. With each incursion, Taiwan could also allow more U.S. presence in Taiwan, either military or in the special economic zone. This way, Taiwan could justify increased U.S. presence as a result of the ADIZ incursion. So this is the larger question about possibility of establishing a military base in Taiwan. The idea that it might be welcomed by the population, right? And if establishing military base is not an option, what are the what are alternatives? I would like invite all of you to respond very briefly to it. Okay. okay uh, uh, I'll, ha I'll have a, a response first, uh, very shortly. Um, having a U.S. presence in Taiwan, military presence in Taiwan, is uh, the first red line that China had drawn. Especially, there's rumor that uh, the U.S. Uh, military ships is going to sail into Taiwan Harbor. Uh, that was being uh, sternly warned by the, by the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But uh, establishing a military base uh, in Taiwan, that's uh, totally uh, would be uh, would be getting a very strong reaction, even a military reaction coming from China. Um, but already there's some coordination uh, with the Taiwan military by the. the PECOM uh, in the old days, some of the retired military officials would come in to the annual drill of Taiwan and try to set up some kind of coordination, but nothing on the official levels. I think that is very important. Uh, everyone realizes there's a political sensitivity in here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have an idea. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, we were in our previous question. We were talking about the relationship between Japan and Taiwan. I, I agree with Professor Guo uh, that uh, if the, there was a U.S. base uh, operated in Taiwan, this would really send China over the wall, and they would activate the anti-sectionist law, and when that would be really bad news for Taiwan, at least at this point. However. I do think there's other ways to provide a military protection to Taiwan. I was looking at the map the other day, and Yonaguni Island is only 68 kilometers <laughs> east of Hualien. And it does have Japanese military forces. Maybe it should be reinforced with US military forces as well. Um, because the, um, that would, uh, in the event of a Chinese military action in Taiwan, it would certainly cut down the reaction time. And it would be a way for Japan to show, yes, for the Taiwan, we are really with you. Um, so, I mean, I'll just throw that idea out there for whatever it might be worth. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think, well, okay. Uh, I think a debate over whether the U.S. should have larger military presence or base in Taiwan is actually similar to a debate between uh, strategic ambiguity and, and right. strategic clarity. So I guess uh, if people are uh, still skeptical about strategic clarity, so 
that 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 actually explains the, the hesitance to to to, uh, to to have larger uh, military base. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing is, too, if, if China were to attack uh, Taiwan, it would be, become a very, very hard place to govern. I mean, people in Taiwan are very experienced at, at carrying out very large, sometimes violent demonstrations. And, and I don't really think that the mainland wants to get into that. Uh, Taiwan is a much more difficult place to govern than some people believe it is. Okay. Thank you. Because we only have seven minutes left. Davey? Yes. You first. Yes. You first. Yes. Okay, I think uh, there's uh, so-called the Tokyo's uh, Taiwan dilemma. Uh, I, for example, in the security issue, uh, for sure that Japan needs to uh, stand stronger with the U.S. to defend Taiwan and, uh, it, it, and itself. Uh, on the other hand, for the economy, uh, Last year, uh, China now is the, uh, is the number one trading partner with Japan. China accounts for 22% uh, uh, of Japanese exports. So I guess uh, uh, really there's a political calculation uh, from the uh, Japanese side uh, to consider any measures when their contingencies uh, occurs. David? Um, mm -hmm. uh, to answer the questions, I think uh, I raised uh, two questions. Um, the Professor Go mentioned about the, the relations between the um, USA government and Taiwan government is, um, is very good, solid rock. If this uh, happened, military action from China against Taiwan, will USA get involved into this conflict, the war between China and Taiwan? Number one. Number two is um, USA government keeps saying that they'd like to see the peace across the Taiwan Strait. And also from the Professor Zhou, we know the long-term goal of the Chinese government is to have a peaceful uh, unification. So what kind of efforts can be done from, from a China, Beijing government point of view, Taiwan government point of view, and also U.S. government point of view? Quickly, one minute each, Professor Guo, Professor Zhou. Uh, I think uh, the last thing that Biden administration would like to decide is to whether they will have to militarily um, get involved with the Taiwan Straits. And uh, I think uh, what uh, Admiral Davidson is putting a warning is that six days, within six years, that PLA may have the capability to attack Taiwan. That is the time bound, I think, uh, holding uh, by the Biden administration. They want to defuse it as soon as possible. Uh, and um, either through dialogue or through other means, uh, I think they try to avoid and delay the decision to whether they should uh, get involved and, and have this fight and have this war uh, with China. We actually have a question, right, that was addressing it, but it's more of a comment. And I mentioned that because it's come up. This is, again, an anonymous question. It says, U.S. Taiwan relations boil down to arms sale and semiconductor. And Bill mentioned something in his presentation about it earlier, right? A hundred percent in the U.S. interest. In Taiwan, three Air Force officers are said to be quitting due to unusually, fre unusually frequent casualties, I guess unusually frequent high casualties. And the question or comment, it's, I think it's rhetorical here, right? Will the upgrade of military weapons truly stabilize the Taiwan Strait? Mm, mm, right? mm, mm, Professor Joe mm. and Bill, and last one minute each. Uh, well, uh, the weapon sales, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I understand why those three officers are, have some chagrin about serving in the military, especially the Air Force officers, to ask people to fly 40-year-old combat aircraft is like asking them to fly a coffin. And uh, that, that's really, I blame some of that on the United States. The United States should have sold F-16s to Taiwan earlier and should have taken those F-5Es and F-5Fs totally out of service. They, they belong in a museum. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I think all the U.S. is doing right now is about deterrence. I think the U.S. is trying to not to involve militarily. 
so I think the U.S. will try everything to deter China. And, and regarding the peaceful reunification question, uh, I think I, well, I think the U.S. is definitely keeping the status quo. And from the Chinese perspective, I think somehow they they will actually think that it's not something that easy to achieve. Uh, so the so I I think right now the U.S. is keeping the status quo. While I think the U.S. will encouraging the two sides to have some conversations at least because there's really no conversation right now. Uh, so having more conversation may ease the situation, but I'm not that sure that would that would really lead to some kind of unification. Okay, and we'll have the final word from Professor Tang, one minute, and then we're out of time. Do you would like to quickly respond to David's questions? Uh, uh, so, I, I, so I, I, I think uh, that uh, this is a four-player game, and Japan uh, play a very important role to protect Taiwan. But unfortunately, I don't think uh, Japan will take actions when China uh, attacks Taiwan. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, you know, and I would like really to thank our participants from Taiwan very much for sharing with us their time and expertise and joining us live from Taipei, which is 18 hours ahead of time, right? Uh, okay, many thanks to our audience for their participation, for their questions. And before you leave, let me remind you, we have a survey. It only takes two minutes, so please make sure you fill out the survey, give us some feedback. And my final reminder is our last event in our CCS seminar series is, takes place on April 28th. And it's an interdisciplinary, interregional panel feature, uh, on the topic of the Mekong, China and South Asian transitions, debates over dams, data, and evidence. So with, on that note, again, thank you very much, especially to our participants in Taiwan. Thank you, Bill, for participating. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tang, for your co-sponsorship. Thank you, David, for joining the dialogue. Goodbye, everybody, and have a good rem remainder of the day and a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.